Good afternoon. My name is George Paris, and I'm recording a video uh, based on a book I've written. I'll talk about the book in a second. But the video is a series that's actually going to be four videos. This is part one. The title of the whole series is Thermodynamics, and I'll get into the details in a moment. Let's go to the next slide. That's me. Uh, I'm a PhD chemist educated back in the 60s and 70s. Didn't actually start teaching until the 2000s, actually, at the end of my career. Now, the, the point I like to make here is that when I was, te when I was in school, undergraduate graduate school, I obviously I did pretty well in my classes and thought I understood thermodynamics well. It turns out that when I got to teaching, it became interesting that students would ask me questions I did not know the answer to. And because they, they were not indoctrinated that this is the way it goes. And so I spent a lot of time into the, you know, I spent about 10 years, first 10 years of my teaching career, trying to understand thermodynamics so that I could answer questions that students ask me. Stuff like, uh, why doesn't uh, an equilibrium constant have units? Okay. What's the relationship between enthalpy and entropy and statistical issues, disorder, organization, stuff like that. So anyway, uh, what I hope to be able to do through this video and through the book, the book is readily available, not very expensive, that's it above my head there, is um, solve a lot of problems that academicians have in trying to explain thermodynamics to their students because I try to unscrew something that's fairly screwed up in academia. Okay, So there are the four uh, uh, videos I'm going to make. They're all in one book and uh, you can buy the book, could use it with the videos or use the book without the videos or look at the videos, whatever to show. Okay, <clears throat> chapter one, we'll talk about some basic stuff here. You have to understand that heat was not understood as we understand it today until the mid-1800s, 150 years ago, 100, maybe 175 years ago now. So before that, people had all sorts of ideas. If you go back to the 1600s, people, it was a mystery. It was like air, earth, fire, and water. And fire was heat, and it was, so it was released when certain elements got together. We went from there. Uh, Newton's laws, etc., and they started by the mid 18, uh, 1700s. They were talking about something called phlogiston, and it's like this is something that's air in other places, and you can release it, and it's uh, sort of a, a physical substance that creates hot. Okay, and it wasn't until Lavoisier in the late 1700s, 1790, that time frame, that it, it was re, it was no longer considered to be an element. It was it was reduced from being an element to being something. Lavoisier looked at it as a fluid that flowed through materials, but it wasn't an element. He didn't think it was an element. So like light, light was another issue that people were dealing with. Now it was not literally until the mid of the 1800s, 170 years ago, something like that, that people understood that heat is kinetic energy stored in molecules. All right, what happened in the middle of all this is something called the Industrial Revolution. People with names like Watt and Joule and Carnot got involved with making steam engines back in the 1700s into the early 1800s, and the steam engines were creating a whole new way of living and had great economic and social impacts. As a result, the engineers sort of took over thermodynamics and they just basically adopted the caloric idea that heat is some sort of a fluid that flows through things and you'll still find that in our textbooks you'll see you'll see the Carnot cycle and stuff like that they'll talk about heat moving from one reservoir to another reservoir and that's the way they interpret it that's the engineering way now, but between that and between the fact that we now have molecular understanding of, of materials and because of the influence of the Boltzmann statistical ideas 
All this is sort of gemished together today in our thermodynamic discussions in your textbooks, all your undergraduate textbooks that you know just covered chemistry or maybe physical chemistry. And it's not very clear, I don't think, to the typical student how this all fits together. And that's what I spent about 10 years trying to, to figure out so that I explain stuff to my students. Uh, yeah, let's start here. What is heat? Well, the most important thing to remember is that heat is kinetic energy stored in molecular motion, translations, rotations, and vibrations. And if you talk about a solid where you, maybe even a liquid where you've got a solid, a particle rattling around inside of a void, it vibrates within that void. You can, that's called a libration, which is the same as a vibration, okay? And so you can look at it that way. Now there's, that's the, First thing to memorize, if you want to memorize something out of this. Now, two points come up. One is, what is absolute zero? I mean, how, can you take all that energy out? And the answer is, yes, there, there is a ability to take heat out of a material. But absolute zero does not mean that everything stops moving, although you will have a lot of you know, high school professors or teachers that will probably say that. What happens is, uh, quantum mechanically, you can't stop motion because of the uncertainty principle. You can't simultaneously know the position and momentum of a particle. And so what happens is that you can, absolute zero is a state in which you've taken all the available energy out. In other words, all the degrees of freedom that a molecule might have have been reduced to their lowest state. But even at the lowest state, they still move. You still have vibrations, etc. Okay, so it is uh, absolute zero. You've taken all the energy that you can take out of the molecule, and that's worth remembering. Okay, now it turns out that in some substances, in particular, electrons get hung up in higher energy levels that are above their ground state, and if you drop them into a temperature zone where they will drop into the ground state, you will get another little bit of energy out of the system and you end up with something called superconductivity. Now, I talk about this at some length in the book, but I'm not going to address it in the videos. It would, it just, it sort of distracts from everything else that's going on. And so since most people are not directly involved with superconductivity, you don't have to worry about that last little bit. And we don't do a whole lot of chemistry down you know, at very low temperatures. Uh, I'm not going to uh, drag you through that in these videos. But there, it is in the book, and you're welcome to go read it. Okay. Now, a lot of our basis for our understanding of heat and the energy that is, is kinetic energy goes back to the kinetic theory of gases. It turns out I've, this, there's a, a foundational amount of information that is tied to the kinetic theory of gases, which we sort of accept as fact into this course, or into this you know, video I'm producing here. I urge you, if you don't, or if you're not familiar with that, please go back. I've created a whole book called The Kinetic Theory of Gases. I'll probably eventually do a video on it. And that video, uh, or that, that theory, really picks up in the early 1700s. A fellow by the name of Bernoulli uh, was working, you have to understand that Newton had just come up with some, some understanding of what momentum and energy and all that sort of thing was. And Bernoulli uh, took that information and created a model for gases. Uh, and that model would have, been very enlightening to a lot of people, but Bernoulli's ideas were not widely circulated. He was, I think, primarily in Russia and Prussia and places like that. And so the, the English, the French, and the Italians, and the, most of the Germans uh, never, never accepted that until the 1800s. In any event, an ideal gas is typically defined as point masses, that is to say, no volume, no dimensions, just a mass. These point masses have no attraction or repulsion for one another or for the container in which they're in. And the, the, the thing that makes this all work well, and you'll see this explained in various ways in various textbooks, but under 
bad at conditions. No energy is gained or lost by the system. Okay, you've got these particles, they're bouncing around inside of a container, and when they bounce around, you don't lose any energy or gain any energy. All right. All the all the kinetic energy is connect, converted into potential energy, converted back to kinetic energy. Some people say that the collisions are all elastic, completely elastic. That's not really true. We'll talk about how what really happens when atoms collide. It's, it's an important phenomenon. In any event, if you go through this model that Bernoulli invented and start sorting it all out, you come out with the gas laws and you come out with the, the relationship shown here at the bottom, heat per mole, the, the lower case N is per mole. Uh, that's going to be kinetic energy per mole, and that's going to be equal to three halves RT for an ideal gas. Now, here's another thing that people, you know, it's just a mystery to most students. What is R? It's like, here's this crazy unit. What is, what is R? It's actually, I'll talk to you about that in a second, but R is a constant. It's actually the heat capacity of an ideal gas. And I'll sh show you how I typically present that to students here in a moment. Anyway, so the, the important point at this point is that heat is directly proportional to the kinetic energy, which is the also uh, directly proportional to the absolute temperature. When I use the capital T, uh, almost always dealing with, with absolute temperature in this video and all the other videos. And so the R is the gas constant and T is the absolute temperature. So there's a direct proportionality between temperature and kinetic energy. Okay, let's uh, let's start defining some terms. And this we don't use this the, the this too much in this discussion, but when you start trying to apply uh, thermodynamics to a system you end up uh, having to understand this, the terminology here. So thermodynamics is a study of the movement of heat. And to do that, we need to know what, what we're talking about. We start off with something called the surroundings. It's the uh, whatever we define as the surroundings. And we have a system which is distinct from the surroundings. And so we basically have two things. We have the system and we have the surroundings. Now we can talk about the movement of heat between the system and the surroundings. Okay, if heat comes into the system from the surroundings, we call it endothermal and we give it a positive sign. If heat leaves the system, it's called exothermal. We use a negative sign indicating exothermal behavior. Now, so we use this plus and minus system to explain the movement of heat relative between the system and the surroundings. So the system can be defined any way you want to define it. Once you define the system, everything else becomes the surroundings. Okay. So the way you go about this, you define the system. It might be the contents of a flask or it might be the contents of a box or whatever. And then everything else that is not within that system, within that definition, is becomes by definition the surroundings. And uh, we look at this plus and minus system from the from the point of view of the system. Okay, now there's one case that we need to talk about. We need to talk about systems that don't have heat moving back and forth between the surroundings, and that means adiabatic systems are isolated from the surroundings such that no heat is gained or lost to the surroundings. All right. Now, there's three ways which heat can be moved from the system to the surroundings. One is conductance. Let's start with that. Here's your surroundings. There's our system. And we're going to talk about this border. Okay, we can have conductance between the system and the surroundings. Conductance is a... a flow of, of heat through the, the, the fringe between the system and the surroundings. Then we have conduct convection. That is a movement of the surroundings actually come into intimate contact with the system and take heat away that way. And then we have radiation, which is a 
uh, quantum mechanical process where the heat is just radiated from the surface of the, of the systems into the surroundings. Now, if we have a, a, a process in the system that happens very fast, these, these phenomena take some time to occur, especially conduction and convection. And so we will not, we will have a system that appears to behave as though it was a um, uh, adiabatic, even though it might not really be adiabatic. For example, an, explo an explosion, which happens very quickly, can be treated as though it's adiabatic, whereas something which is gradually warming up is not going to be uh, treated. You can't treat it as adiabatic. Now we use thermal flask. These are, you know, like a vacuum bottle. Uh, you'll notice it's it's silvered. The silver, you know, prevents the uh, radiation from coming in or going out. The vacuum prevents uh, from having convection, and then you hopefully don't have much, get much conduction through the material of the flask itself. And so we we try to create systems which are almost adiabatic. And we typically can call them adiabatic up to a certain point. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about heat capacity. All right, heat capacity is the ability to store heat in a, at a particular temperature. We can look at heat capacity on a micro level or a macro level. And we generally, chemists and, and folks that do chemical type work, typically going to look at this in terms of Heat capacity per mole of material. You could also look at what's called specific heat, which is in per gram of material. Engineers tend to use the specific heat. Chemists, I think, would prefer to use, certainly make it more productive to use the uh, per mole, heat capacity per mole. Now I'm using the capital C as the, uh, the, the image for uh, heat capacity. And it's a function of temperature. You do not be fooled. Do not think that heat capacity is a constant. It is very temperature dependent. Whether you're, suppose you're solid, even as you remain a solid, as the solid heats up, the heat capacity changes. Certainly, when the solid melts and becomes a liquid, there's a phase change. We'll talk about phase changes a few minutes from now. There's a phase change that also involves heat. And then the, within a liquid, as the liquid heats up, the, the heat capacity changes. And then when you go to a gas, you have another phase change. And then when the, in the gas phase, you also have heat capacity changes. So heat capacity is not a constant. In some cases, you can assume it's a constant if you're talking about a without a change of phase. And if you're talking about a fairly small increment of temperature change, you could treat it as though it's a constant for practical purposes, but don't disturb yourself to think that there's a single number for heat capacity. Heat capacity is constantly changing in all materials. Now, heat capacity uh, is measured in the change in heat contained per mole relative to the change in temperature. It's delta H over delta T, or the change in kinetic energy as the temperature changes. I mentioned phase changes already. They are a special case. We'll have to deal with that separately. All right. If you're familiar with the ideal gas law, most people memorize this PV equal NRT. I think most students have this engraved on their body by the time they get out of their first semester of, or of chemistry, general chemistry classes. I don't like to express it that way because that leaves R as a mystifying constant. Okay, If you go back and re rearrange this equation, you take PV and you divide it by NT and you get R. Well, if you put it in that format, PV over NT, PV is an energy term per mole per degree of Kelvin. And so what you have here is you have R is a gas constant. It's a, a, it is a uh, heat capacity of an ideal gas. It's how much energy, PV, is involved per mole per change in degree temperature. Okay. So that demystifies R, and I prefer to prevent, present this equation to students that way. 
Now, the average heat capacity, this is going to be another situation we get into. This is, becomes very interesting as we get into the second part, the second video. The average heat capacity over a temperature range represents all the heat that is kinetic energy, including phase changes, that is incorporated in the system that goes through the temperature range. Uh, if I go from zero degrees Kelvin to some arbitrary temperature T uh, degrees Kelvin, as I go through that range, the average heat capacity is going to represent all the heat that went into the system through that process. And we'll, that becomes an important idea later on. Now, I use this, this uh, term T soup zero. That's going to represent an arbitrarily chosen reference temperature, whatever it is. Now, it turns out that we use uh, 298 degrees Kelvin as our reference temperature in most cases. That's about ambient. And so you're going to see uh, typically T0 in most of our standard tables and whatnot is going to be 298 degrees Kelvin. Okay, let's go back. Since we're talking about the movement of molecules and atoms, we need to talk about molecular dynamics. Okay, how do things move around? And if every molecule and every atom we can talk about a single atom, we can talk about a collection of atoms in a, as a molecule. Either way, it, the, the system that we're looking at, whether it's an atom or a molecule, will have a center of gravity. If that center of gravity is moving, we call that a translation. Okay, that means we are moving in the reference frame that the, the atom or molecule is in. All right, and that, that is called a translation. If the center of gravity does not move, you do not have a translation. Now, individual atoms, that is a, a, an ideal gas, can only, can only translate. There's nothing else to happen there. So the only degrees of freedom that an ideal gas has or a single atom have is translation. But when you get into molecules, you have other degrees of freedom to get it, the degrees of freedom of all the atoms has to be represented and they are embodied in molecular motion, which we're about to talk about. Degree of freedom is, in this context, how things can move in space. And you have three degrees of freedom in a three-dimensional space, and there they are. And so every particle, every atom, for, for practical purposes, we're going to talk about an atom no longer point masses are going to be atoms. Every atom is going to have three degrees of freedom because every atom can move in three degrees of freedom in, in a three-dimensional space. Okay, now what happens when you make a molecule? Okay, now you've got two atoms. I'm, I'm looking at a diatomic molecule here, which represents, there's all sorts of diatomic molecules, H2, O2, N2, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen into, et cetera. All these diatomic molecules, whether they are uh, the same element or different elements, uh, each atom has three degrees of freedom, and you can look at it from this model. And so if you three times two is six, okay, so that would be the total number of degrees of freedom that must be represented in this molecule. All right, so what are those three degrees of freedom, or those six degrees of freedom that are represented here? Well, going back, I can identify the, the green dot there is the center of gravity of this, this two-atom system, this two-atom molecule. And that, the, that center of mass, center of gravity, can move in three dimensions. So the translations of that molecule, without changing the bond distance and not changing the orientation of the molecule in any way, just moving it in space by moving the, the center of gravity around, represents three degrees of freedom. So that takes care of three of our six degrees of freedom. What are the others? Well, it we, turns out we have in a linear molecule, which includes all diatomic molecules, and a few triatomic and even tetraatomic molecules. For example, carbon dioxide is a linear molecule. 
uh, acetylene uh, is, a, is a linear molecule. But there are very, very few. Once you go past two atoms, the, the, po the, the possibilities for linearity drop off real quick. Anyway, we start off with a total of six degrees of freedom, two to three, six. We subtract out our two translations. And now we look at this molecule and we realize we've got two ways that we could rotate it. So there's two rotations around two axes here that change the positions in space of these atoms in space. If I rotate around either of those two green axes, as I've indicated by the red arrows, I'm, rota I'm moving the atoms in space. Now, if you looked at the, the axis that is, that is running through the center of the two atoms, the blue line there, if I rotate around that, that does not move the atoms in space. And so that is not a separate degree of freedom. All right. So that gives me two rotational degrees of freedom. I start off with six, I subtract three translations, I subtract two rotations, and that leaves me one more degree of freedom, and that happens to be a vibration. And the vibration in this case is just lengthening or shortening of that chemical bond. It's just the two two atoms coming you know, back and forth from one another. So in that diatomic molecule, and this is true for all diatomic molecules, you have three translations, you have two rotations, and you have one vibration. Now, if we go to something more complicated, suppose we have three atoms, and they're not linear. Okay. Got three atoms, they're not linear. <clears throat> then this would account for most of your polyatomic molecules. Water, for example, is a, a good example here. You have three atoms times three gives you nine degrees of freedom in total. There are going to be three translations because you can move the center of gravity in three directions. Now, instead of having just two rotations, now you have that third rotation because now if you rotate the molecule around that other axis, you get a third rotational degree of freedom. You subtract those out, you start with nine minus three minus three, you end up with three vibrations. And here they are. Uh, I think they're over there. Yep, they're over there. And uh, you've got what's called an asymmetric stretch. That means that one of the bond lengths gets long while the other one gets short. Then you have a symmetric stretch in which both of the bonds move uh, in synchronously. They move out in and out together. And then you have something called a bend. Now, in the first two, the symmetric stretch and uh, asymmetric stretch, you're not changing the bond angle. But in the bend, you are changing the bond angle, uh, which necessarily is going to change the center of gravity and all that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, it's just the, the center of gravity doesn't change. The, the, the molecule moves around the center of gravity is what's really happening here in the bend. All right. In fact, the molecule, in all cases, what's happening is the center of gravity of the molecule does not move because these are not translations. What's happening is the atoms move retaining or maintaining the same set of gravity. Okay, <clears throat> now we need to start talking about quantum mechanics a little bit. Hopefully you have a background in quantum mechanics. And this uh, is going to help us understand spectroscopy and heat capacity. And the, the three three concepts are intermingled here in a very a very mutually supportive way. And I really think that this is useful to teach it this way to, to students. Okay, on the atomic electric scale, everything's going to be quantized, okay? You can only have discrete amounts of energy in these systems. And <clears throat> the second point we need to remember is that the energy must be conserved instantaneously. In other words, when something happens, that energy doesn't disappear, go off, and then come back later. It has to be somewhere in the universe, it is conserved instantaneously. And then when we talk about <clears throat> photons and the interaction of photons, that's electromagnetic radiation. When we talk about the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with physical systems, that is to say atoms and molecules, you have to have whole photons absorbed or emitted. You can't 
you can't absorb part of a, fro a photon. <clears throat> and so if you go back to Planck, who came up with this idea initially, um, actually Boltzmann should get some credit. But anyway, the, the photonic energy is h, which this is lowercase h, which is Planck's constant <clears throat> times a frequency. That's the new. And in order for that interaction to happen, the, the photonic energy has to be exactly equal to the change in energy in the physical system when you go from one energy state to an initial, uh, initial state to a final state. Okay. So that the photons have to match up with the energy states of the physical systems. You can you can convert kinetic energy into photonic energy or photonic energy into kinetic energy, but they have to you have to balance the energy all the time. Energy can be in various forms, but it all has, has to be conserved. Okay, let's go back <clears throat> to one of my pet peeves <clears throat> about the kinetic theory of gases. <clears throat> We start talking about the manifestation of, of uh, con conservation of momentum and energy. I need to take a sip of something here. <clears throat> Not only is energy conserved, momentum is conserved. All right. One of Newton's ideas. I'm going to start off my system here. I've got two masses. One mass is mass one, one unit of mass. And it's going to be moving at a velocity, a plus one velocity, which is from left to right on your screen. And then I've got mass two, which has got two units of mass. And it's going to be stationary in space and to have no, no relative velocity relative to our frame of reference. Okay, <clears throat> bang, we have this collision. First thing we have to do, we have to conserve conservation of, of momentum. So if you look at my initial case, I had uh, plus one times one plus two times zero. You add that up there at the bottom there, and you get a total momentum of plus one units. Now, my final situation, once that collision occurred, in order for momentum to be conserved, it must still be plus one. So the, the velocity of that second particle is can't be the same as the velocity of the initial particle. It has to be half that much. In order, in order to have the same final momentum I had when I started, the momentum, uh, the, the, the velocity of the second particle can only be half what the initial particle was. All right. So one times zero plus two times point five is going to be plus one. So there we go. Now keep that in mind. And then let's think about what happened to our kinetic energy. Well, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. One of the things you probably learned in physics in high school. And it has to be energy overall has to be conserved, but kinetic energy per se does not have to be conserved. So if you look at the kinetic energy of the system, before and after, the initial kinetic energy was one half times one times one squared plus two times zero squared, and that all works out to 0. 0.5 units of kinetic energy. After this reaction occurs, after this collision occurs, I have one half times one times zero squared plus two times 0. 0.5 squared, and that works out to be 0. 0.25, all right? And so what happened? My kinetic energy is not the same as I went into the system. And this is what's happening in your gas molecules when they collide out there. Now, that kinetic energy can be converted into photonic energy. And that's what happens. It's called black body radiation. When these particles collide, they lose kinetic energy and it's released as a radiation in the form of a photon. That may not make a lot of sense to you. Maybe say, oh, that sort of seems odd, strange. Let me put, give you an example where it makes, it, you know, it's more obvious to you that it will happen. Let's see if I can go to the next slide. There we go. <clears throat> 
let's say you've got a box, a plastic box, a rigid plastic box with a gas in it. And that gas is at some temperature, 300 degrees Kelvin or something. And you suddenly take that box, which is rigid, it's not going to change shape, and you put it in outer space where the, the ambient temperature of outer space is about 4 degrees Kelvin, not 300 degrees Kelvin. Now, obviously, there's not going to be convection. There's not going to be conductance. There can only be radiation. And I think it, you understand that that gas starts out as at 300 degrees Kelvin, but it's not going to stay at 300 degrees Kelvin if it's surrounded by outer space, which is 4 degrees Kelvin. It's going to lose energy to outer space. The only way it can lose energy is by radiation. So as those particles collide, either with one another or with the container, the momentum is maintained. When the momentum is maintained, the kinetic energy constantly is being de degraded and that the photons are now being released from the system to outer space. Okay, so that's what's happening. We have something called the Stefan-Boltzmann law, uh, radiant, radiant emittance, that is to say that the amount of energy coming out of the system is radiation, is proportional to the absolute temperature T raised to the fourth power. Now, apparently, that's because as the frequency that as the temperature increases, the frequency of collisions increase. You know, it's going to be a factor of T squared. And then as the collisions occur between molecules that are moving faster, the amount of energy that's lost in each collision is also a function of T squared. And so you multiply T squared times T squared, you get T to the fourth. I think that's how that works. Okay, <clears throat> let's change the topic. And let's start talking about quantized energy levels and photons. Now, if I have a physical system, I've defined it here as a this circle. I've got two energy levels, have a ground state, that's E0, that's the lowest energy level available in the, in the system. And then I have E1, that's the, uh, the, the next highest energy level available in the system. And it has a, a difference in energy of delta E. Now, if I have a photon, h nu, which is not equal to delta E, and I send that photon at this system, there's no way the system can absorb the photon because it can only be in the ground state or the excited state. And the difference between those two is delta E, but the photon that's coming in is either going to be bigger or less than that. And so the photon just floats through. Watch this. Isn't this exciting? Okay. When the when the photon energy doesn't match up with the physical energy separations, it can't be absorbed. Now let's have a different case. Let's say I've got the same system. I have the same delta E, but now I've got a photon H nu which is equal to delta E. It can be absorbed. Watch this. Okay, when it is absorbed, instantaneously the system jumps from the ground state to the excited state. Energy is conserved. Now, I'm going to make one statement here I'll have to explain in a minute, but I say it can be absorbed. It doesn't have to be absorbed. There has to be a physical mechanism which allows it to be absorbed. That physical mechanism, since electromagnetic waves are oscillating vectors of magnetism and uh, electric fields. Typically, the, to absorb that photon, you have to have a system which has a change in its uh, uh, electric moment, the dielectric moment, but in these two states. There has to be a change in the uh, uh, electric moment, that's the polarity of the system when you have this absorption occurring. Similarly, if that excited state falls back to the ground state, you can emit a photon which is going to have exactly the energy delta E. And that's the only photon that you can release that way, unless you have some other ways of, of accounting for where the energy went. So this is the basis of, of 
spectroscopy, all types of spectroscopy we use to study molecules in atoms, etc., are based on this principle. <clears throat> now let's look at this a little bit. What are the energy level separations typical of electrons, vibrations, rotations, and translations? Okay. Electronic energy levels are typically separated by an energy on the order of 10 to the 6 joules per mole for tightly bound electrons, and it could be as little as 10 to the 3rd joules per moles for loosely bound electrons. Let's look at, let's look at for example, single bonds, typical single bonds between uh, atoms. They typically are in the range of 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th joules per mole. Uh, or we could put it in terms of kilojoules per mole. That would be 10 to the square to 10 to the 3rd kilojoules per mole. Now, some single bonds, which are fairly easily broken, uh, are going to be on the rate more in the range of uh, ultraviolet light energy. And the pi electrode orbitals in uh, in typical molecules, organic molecules, or in the, the, the delta electrons, the d electrons in atoms, are going to have energy level separations between 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth joules per mole, and that's just the frequency of a visible light. Okay, now. That's your electronic transitions. If you go to your vibration of the molecules, they typically have energy le level separations of about 10 to the third joules per mole. And if you look at rotations, you're about an order of magnitude below that. You're about 10 to the squared joules per mole. And the translations, the energy, energy level separation of translations, is on the order of 10 joules per mole. Now, in the next slide, I have a summary of that. Unfortunately, I'm covering up part of it. Uh, but what you have here, I've done two things. One, I have on the left, I have the mode of energy storage, for example, electronic, vibrational, rotational, and translational. And on the right, I have the typical energy level separations, uh, which start off with electronic. We're talking about 10 to the 18th joules per molecule. We're not talking about per molecule. And that's way out in the ultraviolet, typically. And then if we look at uh, vibrations, uh, we're looking at 10 to the 20th joules per mole, which is turns out to be about 500 to 5,000 reciprocal centimeters. That's where your infrared spectra are. And if you go down to rotations and, and vibrations, unfortunately, I plan this poorly and have blotted out your, uh, your visibility of that. In any event, it works out very nicely that if you look at the temperature necessary to excite a molecule from its lowest energy level to the next highest, we have what I call the, the, the lucky rule of threes. Okay, translations tend not to start, you know, the jump from the lowest translational energy level to the first translational energy level occurs at about three degrees Kelvin. Rotations, you have to go up to about 30 degrees Kelvin before you jump from the lowest rotational energy level to the first excited energy level. Vibrations, you have to go up to about 300 degrees Kelvin to go from the ground state vibrational condition to the first excited state. And then your electronic transitions, you have to go up to about 3000 degrees Kelvin. So this is easy to remember, 3, 3, 300, 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And think about it for a second. Here, if we are at ambient temperature, is about 300 degrees Kelvin. So what, what this is telling us is, is at ambient conditions, where we do most of our chemistry, vi most of the molecules are going to be in their ground vibrational state. And what we're going to look at when we look at an infrared spectrum is typically excitation from the ground state to the first vibrational excited level. But at the same time, 
the molecule is going to be in a variety of rotational states and translational states, if it's able to translate. So at, at 300 degrees Kelvin, the, the molecules are not merely in the first or vibrational state. They're spread out through a, a series of vibrational, excuse me, rotational states. And so when that happens, we're going to get into statistical thermodynamics, okay, because the population of those states is going to change as we change the temperature. And at 300 degrees, you expect a, a number of different rotational states to be uh, populated. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> the energies that I've calculated there are based on RT, R being four point, or excuse me, 8.314 joules per moles degree Kelvin. That's not what you typically teach people in the gas laws, but this is the thermodynamic equivalent of that. And that's the heat capacity of an ideal gas in joules per mole per degree Kelvin. Okay. <clears throat> Since most large molecules decompose at 3,000 degrees Kelvin, we usually are not faced with worrying about that. Okay. So at 3,000 degrees Kelvin, atoms exist and some very stable molecules such as carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide may exist i'll show you examples later but uh for the most part we don't have to worry about big molecules existing at 3000 degrees kelvin now if you look at the atoms you get this atomic excitations and this i believe is the potassium spectrum yes this is potassium spectrum what's happened you've heat these molecules up and then the electrons get excited into higher energy states. And then when they drop back, you get these emission spectra, which you're looking at here on the screen. Okay, <clears throat> let's go take this into spectroscopy big time. Uh, to do this, I'm gonna use a molecule. I, li I like, I just have, the, the data for this just work out real nice. This is, this is formaldehyde. It's a aldehyde. It's got a carbon, oxygen, double bond, and a couple of hydrogens of the carbon. So it's a simple molecule. It's got four atoms, and four times three would be 12 degrees of freedom, right? Well, we're going to have three translations. We're going to have three rotations, and that's going to leave us with six vibrations. And here they are. Oops, what happened? No, wait a minute. Okay. I'll get back to that in a second. It'll be the next slide. Now, going back to what I was saying earlier, the, the, the levels of the vibrations, the, the vibrations are over here. Here again, I'm, I'm obscuring the, uh, the vibrational modes. But there's going to be, what would we say? There's going to be six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six vibrational modes. That's on the right-hand side of your screen there. And I've got that at a scale of one. And then on the left, I've got your three translations and three rotations, and they are on a scale of about five times magnified. In other words, if, if I put the, the vibrations, the rotations, and translations all on the same scale, you wouldn't be able to see. I mean, all the translations would just be one big stack of, of uh, energy levels on top of one another and the rotations would be slightly separated so i expanded that up so this is what you're looking at here now let's go to look at that spectrum here it is this is the gas phase spectrum of formaldehyde and they are six very nice absorptions one two three four five six and they are the asymmetric stretch symmetric stretch a CO stretch, a scissoring stretch, a rocking stretch, and a wagging stretch. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. Well, a rocking stretch to see that it's so like that. Wagging is like wagging is like that. Rocking is like that. Let's see, rocking, wagging. Okay, then there's a twisting. So you've got these different uh, things, and you've got the scissoring thing. So the 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 names of these these uh, vibrations are you know some uh, consistent with the physical changes that you're looking at. So this is formaldehyde. 
Now, what about uh, this? There's another detail I mentioned earlier. In order for that photon to be absorbed, not only does it have to match the energy level of the change in the physical system, but there has to be a mechanism for that photon to interact with the physical system. And in the case of electromagnetic radiation, we're looking at a electric uh, oscillation. And so we need a change in uh, the dipole moment of the molecule to interact with that. So let's look at carbon dioxide, which is a linear molecule. It has three translations, three, two rotations, and ends up with four vibrations. And there's the four vibrations. You have a symmetric stretch, that would be A. You have an asymmetric stretch, that's B. And then you have a in-plane and out-of-plane bending vibrations, okay? <clears throat> and so that's your, those are your four uh, vibrations of the molecules. Now, the, the thing about it is, those bending vibrations change the dipole moment of the molecule. And the asymmetric stretch changes the dipole moment of the molecule. But that symmetric stretch, A, does not change the dipole moment. Although the bonds have dipoles, that is to say the carbon-oxygen bonds have bond dipoles, in the linear molecule, those dipoles offset one another. And changing the bond length doesn't change the dipole moment of the molecule. So there's no mechanism through which that photon that inner would have the correct energy for that. There's no mechanism where it can transfer from the photon to the physical system. So let's look at the infrared spectrum of carbon monoxide, or excuse me, carbon dioxide. And if we, we start examining this, what we find out is here's your asymmetric stretch, and there's a absorption for the asymmetric stretch. These two bending modes, they're, they should, you know, it's, it's, they're degenerate. They both have the same energy. And yep, they show up over here in the bending modes. Now, we can calculate what the energy would be for the, asymmet for the symmetric stretch, and there should be a point, a, a absorption here, but because there's no mechanism, that's to say there's no change in the dipole moment of the molecule that would absorb that photon, it doesn't occur. It'll, that photon, although it matches, will just zip on through and not interact because there's no physical mechanism where the energy of the photon can be converted into the energy of the mechanical system. Okay, <clears throat> very useful equation. This is what I call the Boltzmann distribution. This is actually Boltzmann and Maxwell worked on this. And this is distribution, tells us how kinetic energy would be distributed among various degrees of freedom. This is the equation. I think I've got it there. Yep, there we go. That equation the n over n, capital N, i over n, zero, that's the, the number of molecules in the excited state i, whichever i state that is, relative to the ground state zero. That, that ratio is predicted by the numbers on the right. G is the degeneracy of the levels, the, the, the i-th energy level and the g zero energy level. In other words, if you have twice as many uh, en uh, energy levels at uh, GI, at the I level, then zero, that's going to have, have a, a statistical effect on this. But we're going to assume for most cases that these, the degeneracy is, is the same. In other words, the, this ratio GI over G zero is going to typically be one. And we're going to focus on the second part of this, the exponential part. RT is the thermal energy that's available, and the delta E, that is the energy level separation of the energy levels. So typically, this delta E <clears throat> is in joules per mole. R is the universal gas constant, which is in joules per mole. 
G is the degeneracy of the ith energy level uh, when there are two or more energy levels, the same energy, etc. We're not going to worry about that. In most cases, we're just going to see this. the degeneracy is one, that ratio is one. So this is actually a pretty easy uh, thing to understand. The numbers are readily available, and we can go from there. We're, this is going to show up repeatedly, and we're going to get use it extensively in the fourth video in the series, where we talk about kinetics and rates and equilibrium, things like that. Okay. <clears throat> now, based on the discussion above, we have to think about something here. When you rotate a molecule, the moment of inertia has to change with the bond length. Okay, go back to our diatomic molecule and think about the rotation of that molecule. The moment of inertia is going to be bigger when those, these uh, atoms are farther apart than that when they are close together. So you have a fun, a, an interesting phenomenon occurring. You, you have a rotational energy level that has to change as the vibrational energy level changes. In other words, when the, when the molecule is in a higher vibrational energy level, it must also have a higher rotational energy level and vice versa. We say that these two molecular motions are coupled together. And that results in an interesting thing spectroscopically. Here is the rotational vibrational spectrum of hydrogen chloride. Now, typically, if you just thought about the, the vibrational transitions, you would expect an absorption at this point. But you don't get that because every time the molecule vibrates, changes the vibrational energy level, it also changes the rotational energy levels. And remember, there's a bunch, when we're talking about at ambient temperature, we have just this one transition for the vibrational energy levels. But we have dozens potentially hundreds or thousands of energy levels of rotational energy levels that are filled. And so what happens is you have transitions simultaneously occurring either where a rotational energy level goes up in energy or goes down in energy. And so you get nothing here in the middle, but then you get all these spikes on either side. And this, this curve here is very interesting. That's a Boltzmann distribution of the trans of the rotational energy levels. You're looking at the Boltzmann distribution of the rotational energy levels in this vibrational rotational spectrum of uh, uh, hydrogen chloride. So we're able to see the populations of the rotational energy levels because these peaks, each one of these represents how many molecules are in this particular energy level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we see a Boltzmann distribution of those energy levels. Very interesting, useful piece of information. <clears throat> now let's look at the storage of energy in the vibrations. All right. As we just showed, the ambient temperature of most molecules will be in the lowest vibrational state. Okay. But as we increase the amount of energy in the system, the vibrational, some of the vibrational uh, excited states will become populated. And so I'm not going to explain this too much, but basically we're just populating higher energy states as the temperature goes up. And it, it, you, you get a change from here. At very low temperature, there's no energy stored in vibrations. It's all in the ground state. But at very high temperature, that 
energy storage can go up to R. That is to say, the amount of energy that can be stored in a vibrational state is R. It's the same heat capacity as an ideal gas. All right. So this, if you're if you're doing quantitative work, you can estimate, you know, based on this factor here, you can estimate <clears throat> where on this curve you are. But the the most energy that you can store in a vibrational state is R. Every degree of every degree of vibrational uh, freedom, you can store R energy in or you can store at very low temperature zero and in between you're going to get a number somewhere between r and zero so uh, typically if you're around ambient you're going to be looking here <clears throat> at about one half r roughly okay let's look at the heat capacity of some real compounds all right the heat capacity of ideal monatomic gases at constant volume and we're going to call that heat capacity C sub V, constant volume, is going to be 3 halves R. That came out of the gas laws, all right, which we haven't derived here. And the heat capacity at constant pressure, now if, if we allow this gas to expand or contract, we're, cha we're changing the volume. So volume is not going to be constant, but the pressure can be constant. If we keep it at constant pressure, like a suppose we got a balloon and we're blowing it up, constant external pressure, and the it's expanding against that, you're doing work. So there's a a PV P delta V term. Pressure times the change in volume is work, and so the, your heat capacity constant pressure is going to be equal to the heat capacity constant volume plus this PV term, P delta V over NT, which is going to be the heat capacity of constant volume plus R. Okay. Okay, so now if the C sub V is 3 halves R, and you've added, a, now you've got the heat capacity of constant pressure adds an R to that, now you have 3 halves R plus R, that's 5 halves R, and so we can calculate the heat capacity of an ideal gas, the heat capacity constant pressure for an ideal molecule gas is going to be 20.785 joules per mole degree Kelvin. So we've got the heat capacity of an ideal gas. Let's look at some examples here, I believe. There is uh, the heat capacity of helium, krypton, and xenon. You notice that it changes a little bit, is very close to the ideal for helium. As you go to krypton and xenon, what you have is you have some electronic distortions. You can change the shape of the, of the molecule as they collide into one another. So there's a little more heat capacity involved there. But for the most part, you're looking at that. Unfortunately, I believe I am obscuring, yes, I'm obscuring some diatomic gases. They're all higher. The diatomic gases have higher heat capacities because then you've got a vibrational and rotational degrees of freedom. And if you go to methane, which is a tetra, uh, excuse me, a pentac uh, uh, atomic molecule, you have an even higher heat capacity. Okay. So if we look at the heat capacity of carbon dioxide over a range of temperatures, I'm going to show you a very interesting table below. The heat capacity at constant pressure is going to be the heat capacity of at constant volume of translation, the heat capacity at constant volume of rotation, the heat capacity at constant volume of vibration, and the heat capacity at constant volume of electrical uh, you know, electrical excitation plus R. Keep in mind the following general rules. This goes back to the, the table I provided you with earlier. Below 30 degrees Kelvin, rotations, vibrations, electronic degrees of translations are not available for energy storage. So below 30 degrees Kelvin, we're only looking at R plus the translational degrees of freedom. When we get up to 300 degrees Kelvin and above, now we can start, we will be populating the rotational degrees of freedom but we're just starting to populate 
the vibrational degrees of freedom. So we're just starting to put heat heat into vibrations. And we're not doing anything with electronic at that temperature. When we go to 3,000 degrees Kelvin, now we're populating translation, rotation, and vibration, and the electronic degrees of freedom plus R. Okay. So as, as, as I pointed out early in this conversation, the heat capacity is not a constant number. As you change the temperature, you will be bring other degrees of freedom into play and you will be able to store energy into those degrees of freedom. And that's what's happening here. Let's go to the next table. For simple you know, res uh, understanding, each degree of freedom for translation <clears throat> represents one half R and the minimum contribution would have to be about three degrees Kelvin. And at, you know, you, by the, by the time you get to hundred degrees Kelvin, you've essentially randomized the distribution. All the, all the translational degrees of freedom are going to be occupied. It's going to be a, a, a randomized dispersion of molecules among those degrees of freedom. Now rotations, there's also a one half R per degree of freedom. And they don't become important in your heat capacity until you hit 30 degrees Kelvin. And by the time you're up to about 200 degrees Kelvin, which is still below ambient, they're going to be pretty randomized. It's, you know, you're, you're going to have random distributions in the rotational degrees of freedom. So you can't store any more energy. So what the bottom line is once you get that condition, you're not storing any more energy in either translations or rotations. <clears throat> now in vibrations, you start storing energy in vibrations. By the way, every degree of freedom in vibrations can potentially go to R. That would be the maximum, not the minimum, the maximum. And the minimum temperature you have to be to start using that heat capacity is going to be at about 300 degrees Kelvin. And that will continue up to about 2000 degrees Kelvin, at which point most molecules will fly apart. Okay, you no longer, no longer have bonds because they're flying apart at 2000 degrees Kelvin. So keeping this in mind, as we increase the temperature from three degrees to 30 degrees, 300 degrees, we bring in other degrees of freedom and they, those degrees of freedom provide additional opportunity for storing heat in our molecule. So let's go. Here is the experimental data for the heat capacity of carbon dioxide. Now if you start way over there, over there, in blue, if we talk about, <clears throat> remember carbon dioxide is it sublimes at like minus 78 degrees Kelvin or something like that. And so we're, we're looking at a gas at say 175 degrees Kelvin. The heat capacity, which is primarily made up of translations and rotations, is going to be 31.2 joules per mole degree Kelvin. Okay, that's, remember it was 20 something for the translations alone. And now we've got additional uh, contribution from the rotations and we're up to 31. If we go up to 200 degrees Kelvin, that's the next line there, still in, still in blue, it's up to 32.3. And we're getting some, the, the, the bending vibrations are slightly contributing to this now because we're, the bending vibrations are the least energetic of the uh, molecular vibrations of carbon dioxide. And so we're starting to get some contribution from that. When we're at 300 degrees Kelvin, we're up to 37.2 joules per mole degree Kelvin. That's the heat capacity C sub P. And we're starting to get bending. And as we get higher, we're going to get stretching vibrations contributing. And so as you go from 300 degrees Kelvin up to say 1000 degrees Kelvin, you see a steady increase in the heat capacity of carbon dioxide. It goes from 37.2, if you go up to 700 degrees, you're up to 49.5, and it starts saturating 
uh, that last 300 degrees only buys you another five uh, joules per mole degree Kelvin. Okay, so the heat capacity is is saturating for vibrations when you get up to about a thousand degrees. And at 2,000 degrees Kelvin, if you move to, to directly above me here, the heat capacity is pretty well stuck about set, about 60 uh, joules per mole degree Kelvin because the vibrations are all saturated. They're randomized, as are the tra the translations, the rotations, and the vi are all randomized. And so you've saturated the heat capacity of the molecule. It's at 62. Now, when you get to 4,000 degrees, you're, you're looking, I'm looking, changing by 2,000 degrees from two from 1,000 to say 3,000 degrees. I'm only gaining about 10 joules per mole for whatever. Only when you go to 4,000 degrees do you start getting some electronic excitations. So carbon dioxide is actually reasonably stable at 4,000 degrees, and its heat capacity is. Now we're up to 63.2, and even at 6,000 degrees, it's up to 64.9. So we've, after we have saturated the vibrations, the rotations, and the translations, we do not get much additional heat storage in the molecule. Okay, we've just we've just randomized the molecule at all those different degrees of freedom, and there's nowhere to go from there. Okay. Now, overall, the heat capacity, C sub V, always increases as the temperature increases because more energy levels become available for storage of energy. Straightforward. Between 3 and 2,000 degrees Kelvin, the mechanical systems provide energy storage systems. And above 2,000 degrees Kelvin, we start getting electronic states contributing to the heat capacity. Now, the PV work term is constant. It's, it's R at all temperatures at constant pressure. Now in liquids, <clears throat> the heat capacity includes the enthalpy of breaking intermolecular bonds. In particular, intermolecular hydrogen bonds can vary from, uh, say, about 2 kilojoules per mole to about 160 kilojoules per mole. So if you're talking about heat capacity of a liquid as opposed to a gas, now you've also got a possibility of breaking these intermolecular bonds. So you're actually dissociating the, the molecules from one another. And when you actually, what happens is you eventually uh, go into the, the uh, supercritical fluids. Okay, you have, a, you have fluids that act like gases, but they're liquids because they, but they don't have any, any intermolecular bonds. The intermolecular bonds have all been dissipated. All right, so let's go from forth from there. Let's go back and talk about absolute zero again. Before leaving this topic, we should notice that by defining the energy levels of all degrees free, we can provide a clear definition of absolute zero temperature. Absolute zero is the state in which a molecule is in its lowest available energy level in all degrees of freedom. This does not mean that the molecule motion stops. Okay, now one of the things that's very hard to, to show students and classes is the effect of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But this provides us with a, a teaching point, an opportunity to, to talk about that. Uh, you may have heard of Warner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If you go into the vibration of a diatomic molecule, you find that there's something called zero point energy. And that zero point energy, which is unfortunately obscured over here between, over my head, about there, okay. That zero point energy, which is the, the blue lines over here, uh, that corresponds to a change in bond length which is indicated by the red line, the red double arrow. And so what's happening is the zero point energy is the lowest energy level that the molecule can actually be found in. And at that energy level, it's still going to vibrate. It's still going to 
have a vibrational degree of freedom because it moves back and forth because of the uncertainty principle. That double-headed uh, red arrow at the bottom represents the uncertainty in the position of the atom when we know what its energy is. Okay, when we know what its momentum is, its energy is, we have a uncertainty in its location, and that's what that that double uh, bonded arrow is. So this this is an opportunity to teach people that hey, this uh, uncertainty principle is real, and it is actually has an effect that we observe. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at heat capacity of metals and simple salts. These are the librations we were talking about earlier. If you look up the upper right hand corner of the slide, those <clears throat> um, assume that that atom in the middle is surrounded in a, you know, some sort of a uh, environment by these, I guess there's two, there's, I guess there's six uh, uh, other atoms surrounding it. And in the case of simple metals, it has been found that the heat capacity is related to the, uh, it's not related to the atomic mass. It's all of them have a very similar heat capacity in terms of joules per mole, because all of them approximate, remember for ideal gas, it was about 20 point something. Well, if you take, you know, that same three R that you have in the gas, uh, you have about 24 point something uh, joules per mole. And so all of these metals behave in a very uh, predictable form, and they all have the same heat capacity per mole, not per unit mass, which was a, a uh, important thing. Now, if we go to a simple salt, the problem is a bit different. With a simple salt, you have <clears throat> the tendency here to uh, have uh, various things happen. First off, some of these bonds are not purely ionic. And also, if you start comparing these things, you find out that you have different crystal structures. And so you have different amounts of energy stored in the crystal because the crystal structures are different. So in some cases, you do have uh, a 3R relationship, more or less. For example, if you look at sodium chloride, uh, 3R would be 49.9, and the actual heat capacity is uh, about 50.5. If you go to sodium oxide, Na2O, you have uh, 74.8 would be 3R, and you actually observe 73.0, that type of stuff. But in most cases, there's some deviation. Uh, we're, you know, we're in the same ballpark. They're not orders of magnitude difference. But uh, we do have some that appear to behave in a, a normal, you know, uh, as particles suspended in space type of, of uh, phenomena. And in others, there are other factors such as uh, covalent bonding and or crystal structures that are affecting that. Okay, now we're at the end of, of part one, and uh, this has set us up, I believe, to go on to the second part, where we're going to actually talk about enthalpy, entropy, and free energy, okay? But this, this whole part one that I've gone through here for about an hour uh, is uh, quite a bit um, ignored in most uh general chemistry classes, and it's not even taught very much in the um, uh, thermodynamics classes. Uh, it, but it does tie together a number of factors. I like the, the, the tie into the thermodynamics and the spectroscopy angles, and it helps us understand some of those things that we don't necessarily otherwise understand. So I'm going to wrap this up here. Have a great day. Thank you for your time. I guess this ran for about an hour and 20 minutes which is not too long for one of my videos. I do these in one shot. I don't, this is just the way I'd give a lecture in class. 
So if you were taking a summer class with me that was an hour and a half, you would have just finished my first lecture. And uh, otherwise, uh, enjoy your day.